The guys and I come out of our shell on episode 172 of the Cinema Psycho Show, where we talk all things turtle. Cowabunga! Oh, goody, goody, here it comes. Welcome to the Cinema Psycho Show. You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. (laughs) Oh, my God, don't stop now! With your hosts, Brian, John, and Elaine. Welcome to the Cinema Psycho Show, the madhouse for film freaks and film fans of all types. I'm your host, Brian Coddington. Join my fellow co-hosts and filmmakers, John and Lane Wolscroft. Time's up. Three bucks off. Oh, man, I couldn't <laughs> find the place. <laughs> You're two minutes late, dude. Uh, <laughs> Wise man says never pay full price for late pizza. <laughs> if you've never seen the movie we're discussing this week, I bet you're confused. 30 goddamn years. You guys uh, feel old yet? Yeah. Dude, I've felt old this entire yes. year. <laughs> yeah, last year we did a 30-year retrospective on Batman. Now we're doing a 30-year retrospective on Turtles. And I need a walker. Listen, oh, yeah. listen I have aged seven years in the month of March 2020 <laughs> alone. I was going to say, uh, I was gonna say this, hi, this hi, month has taken it off a lot. Of years, a lot of years. Mm-hmm. I've mm-hmm. counted a couple more lines on the face. Then, like those are my March face, my, my March lines right there. Mar- March lines, March yeah. lines. You'll March you'll lines. be able to name every ring like a tree stump. Yep, <laughs> yep. So uh, yeah, we're on episode one seventy two, uh, and we are of course still doing this thing remotely, <laughs> which is social fun, distancing, which is fun. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you didn't catch our little gag there, if you're one of those, uh, you know, young millennials or what are they called now? Xenials? Generation Z. Z- okay. Generation what? Gen Z. Gen what? Z. Whatever. Um, if you're one no, of those No, not whatever. We got to keep the generation straight because when boomers shit on millennials, we have to make sure they know it's Gen Z. That wasn't us. Yeah. That wasn't that us. That wasn't us. We're, we have back problems and anxiety. Yes. That's us. Yes. Although um, there really is no such thing as a generation. That's just how we are marketed to. It's, it's true. It's true. It's true. But either way, uh, for our, our youngin' folks out there, we're going to be talking about the uh, 1991, right? Was it 91? 90. 90. 90. Oh, 90. See what this thing uh, has done? 30-year retrospective. Do you, do that do you math, see? Son. Do you see what? <laughs> yeah, but here's the thing. Do you see what this corona stuff has done? <laughs> it has quite literally ruined my my laser targeted kids, John. focus <laughs> on on movie years. But either way, we're gonna be talking about the 1990 classic Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, not the Secret of the Ooze that came two years later. Actually, it was just one year later. It was the the first two movies were popped out almost a Fucking year apart. Hell. I think it was like 14 <laughs> months apart. Are you actually. trying to kill? You are trying, trying to kill, kill me through the internet, <laughs> and then they. And then they never made another Turtles movie again, ever. Um, <laughs> no, they not made at all. A third one though, John, and yeah. a fourth one. We don't need to talk. We don't need Michael to talk about Bay those. Ones. Michael yeah. Bay ones. I forgot about that. So, so this whole thing with Turtles has uh, kind of been reignited because of the fact that I have a little kid, uh, a little baby. Yeah. Who I have little I, baby. I, well, I mentioned this to you all kind of beforehand that I've been trying to introduce her to the classics, so. She watched, and some people will probably think I'm horrible. She watched some Indiana Jones movies. She's watching Batman, you know, uh, A Nightmare Before Christmas, you know, and she loves the movie Coraline because that's her name, uh, Coraline. Right. But, uh, you know, a couple months back, I showed her, because it showed up on Netflix, the first and second Turtles. I did. Yeah, I saw the first one on on Netflix. That was actually nice. I just put it on and, like, just chilled for the evening. I was like, oh, I was like, this is so good. It is so early nineties. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so what what guys, what is uh best place to start here if we're doing a 30 year retrospective? What was your first memories? That's of a good this one. movie. Oh, this was this is so picture perfect Americana childhood. It it hurts. <laughs> I I went to this movie, I saw this movie in the theater. Nope. Went with the boys next door. So like friends next door. We went we went to get pizza first. Of course. As you do. Was it Pizza Hut? It was it Pizza has to be Hut. Pizza Hut. <laughs> and we went to Pizza Hut and we went to see the movie. I I was so young because we were five. Yeah. I only have flashes and they say that every time you're 
you know, bringing up a memory. You're just remembering the last time you remembered it. So it's so faint now. Honestly, it's it's the smell of like pepperoni pizza. It's the feeling of being in the old theater in my hometown that doesn't even run anymore. You know, there's barely any real grit to the memories anymore. But it's it's the perfect picture of, you know, your friends from next door and pizza and turtles and everything. And then, and I believe my uncle took me to the second one. I think that that's, I think that's how that went down. You know, what's funny though. I could ask my mom and I bet that she would have it all mapped out. She forgets nothing. And she tells me all the time how worried she is about dementia or Alzheimer's. I'm like, bitch, you know, things that I have long forgotten. (laughs) She has nothing to worry about. I swear. Yeah. For me, it was, um, same thing. The old man came home. He was a Pittsburgh Post Gazette guy, and but we lived in Edinburgh, so he had to come home with the Erie Daily Times so we could get the Movie Times because well, otherwise, how else do you know what a movie is going to be right. showing? You know, if only there was some electronic information source that you that's, could access that's from any crazy place. science fiction shit. Right? Yeah, there. I don't need your garbage there, <laughs> Doctor Brown. <laughs> um, but yeah, and you know, the, I think the the entertainment section to me it was the front page, but it was just the front of the entertainment section. It was like the turtles take over or something. Like that. I was like, <gasps> you know, and this is after Batman, and I think I think before Dick Tracy. I'm not sure. Like Dick Tracy came out the same year, but you know, like, the, those were the holy trinity for me when I was a kid. Yeah, you know, we picked the Showtime. My mom somehow got the fuck out of it, so my dad and <laughs> my sister and I. Um, so back to what in Erie we, we lovingly called the Dollar Theater back when it was the big time movie theater. Oh yeah, um, yeah. And it after used that, to show movies for a dollar when we were in college. It was it's yeah, glorious. It was the most magnificent thing ever. Put the celluloid and then the VHS tape, which my parents then lost their minds because we would play almost every weekend. Yes, my sister and I. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. for me, I actually I I don't remember so much seeing it in the theaters. I'm pretty sure I probably did because I was obsessed with Turtles back in the day. Mm-hmm. Like, I watched the cartoon at, you know, every Saturday that it popped on. You know, I had the Turtles uh, truck, and, you know, it, it was insane. Um, at the time, it was basically a split love between Batman and Turtles. You know, that's that's pretty... John, you're probably in the same boat there. You know, you were exposed oh, yeah. to Batman and, mm-hmm. and Turtles at the same time. Um, I also loved Dick Tracy as well, and I actually had... A uh, Dick Tracy lunchbox. Nice. <laughs> Ooh, that was a, your lunchbox. Okay. I had a big plastic rubber red Dick Tracy book bag. That Ooh. was my kindergarten book bag. Now, yeah. was that before or after the Hulk Hogan lunchbox? Oh, the, that Hulk Hogan lunchbox was in my Dick Tracy book bag. That, that's, oh. of course. Yeah, you yeah, have, yeah, yeah. And, of course, you have a thermos that goes with the lunchbox. Uh, you have to have the yes, thermos. Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, but the point is, is that I, I have more fond memories of the VHS experience because for the me the VHS experience had that Pizza Hut commercial that was at the beginning of it and I think John you actually have said the the lines for the Pizza Hut commercial up in the distance there's strings going on there's strikes on the better and runners are on suddenly everyone's looking at me pointing to the sky what do i see I look up in the sky, straight up above, and a baseball falls into my glove. I play right field. It's important to know. You gotta know how to catch. You gotta know how to throw. That's why I play in right field, why out where the dandelions grow. You would never guess we've been trapped in the house for 24 days. Bravo. I swear, John could be a surgeon if you had just put every bit of knowledge you need to be a doctor to song, and he would remember it. Yeah. Because you haven't heard that song recently, right, John? Like, you haven't memorized it or made any effort. No, not at all. Not at all. He heard it when we were kids, and he just remembers it because it's in song form. I'm actually terrified to put, you know, because VCRs just kind of break down over time. Yeah. Of any of my childhood VHS tapes, I'm afraid to put them in a VCR anymore because, like, you know, I'm afraid they're going to get eaten. Although you can find that on YouTube if you really yeah. want to yeah. see that. You know, check that out. <laughs> but I mean, I I'm kind of in the same boat as you, John. I played my VHS tape of Turtles ad nauseum, and you know, that, those some of my memories are going between Turtles and Batman. And uh, I, I don't think I had Dick Tracy on, on VHS tape, but um, I didn't either. Yeah, yeah. That, the, the thing is with Dick Tracy. I know this isn't an episode about it, but Dick Tracy has a <laughs> lot. <laughs> of sexual shit in there that I'm pretty sure kids shouldn't have been really watching. Oh, a hundred percent shouldn't have been like, gross. 
the, is the, Warren Beatty wanted to and did bang the lead actress. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know that. But just like going back, you're like, eh, is Dick Tracy really for kids? I don't think it really is. It's more for, for adults uh, who just want to see Madonna in skin tight clothes. I mean, that's uh, I mean, at the time, didn't have to go far for that. It's true. But I would have preferred Al Pacino in skin tight clothes. <laughs> Look at my balls. Well, um, but, wow. wow. We went yeah. to some dark, fun places, but, didn't we, gents? But speaking of tone, this this movie is graphically different than the cartoon series, which, you know, some people, I'm sure, were the fans of the comic, like probably older, maybe mm-hmm. 12 to yeah. 20. But, you know, when I was a kid, it was just the cartoon and the toys. So when this movie mm-hmm. came out, like, you know... The origin I, is a comic, though, for anybody yeah, who was wondering. Correct. And this movie That's is, confusing sometimes, I for, think. Uh, as dark as you can get on a movie based about teenage turtles that that fight guys in pajamas, like and a giant a, rat, the talks. A giant rat. Uh, this is a very dark movie. It like, does go they, dark they, places. They, I agree, but I still, agree. it's still for kids though. Like, but that kind of like Temple of Doom, Batman, nineteen eighty nine, kind of dark. That you know, yeah, um, it was it was a weird time for quote unquote kids movies. You know, I think it prepared us for all the trauma that we'd experience later. Like, you know, a terrorist attack in our teens and <laughs> a pandemic in our 30s. Yeah, yeah. Well, director Steve Barron, <laughs> like, he met with um, Peter Ladd and Kevin Eastman, and they wanted to do a movie based on the comic book. They didn't really want to do one based on the cartoon, but they knew, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll use the comic as mainly our focus, but we got to put in things from the cartoon or the kids are not going to want to show up. What was you know, the director's background, John? Uh, he was a music video director. Um, I think that's important to note of for things. this film. Uh, Billy Jean. Um, I mean, super big videos. Yeah, Take on me. Yeah, so like really creative ones too. I would yeah, say he was one of the one of the big names of that era in music videos, and one of the biggest names ever. And so I'm surprised he didn't do more um, with his career. Not that he hasn't had consistent work, but he's never had like another big hit. You know, in terms right. of in terms of movies, so maybe he didn't was. like it. You know, well, well, could could it be possibly that he might have been pigeonholed as the Turtles guy? Yeah, that's possible. I mean, you it's know? it's very niche. You know, directing a bunch of people in in puppetry. You well, know, interestingly, the pr- the producers took this movie away from him. The oh, in, yeah. At the very end of it, I think like the last week of shooting was done without him, and he had very minimal control or say in the editing of the film because, interesting because apparently he wanted to go extremely dark okay. and the producers were like this is a movie for kids to sell lunch boxes so maybe back the fuck up you know? <laughs> <laughs> and i mean yeah. you know like there there are some elements in this movie that uh yeah they're they're really dark in there like i i mean this is this is probably the most bizarro out there one but why don't we start there um, do the turtles want to like bang April O'Neil? Because it seems. <laughs> oh like they no! Do. I did. I oh, wondered yeah. how long it would take to get to this question. Oh, they totally want to fuck her. Remember Ew, that scene in the Wolf? So There's a scene in the Wolf of Wall Street where we first get introduced to like you know the main female lead and like Jonah Hill is on drugs and he's just jerking off of probably even realizing <laughs> that was Michelangelo. In this yes. Movie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 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 He was. Rude. By the way, sorry, Michelana. By the way, be on the lookout for my interview with Michelangelo coming out soon. Well, you have to sorry. ask him that. You have to ask <laughs> he, him that. He already interviewed yeah, him. Already you already interviewed. You, did you ask him? Okay, so what was your direction? I think you need yeah. to have a turtle-sized boner for, <laughs> you know, April well, O'Neil in this. Well, boner would be quite small for a real turtle. Well, but this is an anthropomorphic one. I think Mikey go. and Raph were into her. Leo was too focused on, you know, training like a tool. <laughs> You know, and Don Tello was just like, I don't know, he he just like he kind of did his own thing. He was yeah, Donnie. He was high all the Donnie time. in the movies did not do machines like he does in the cartoons. Well, in the second, yeah, he third didn't one, do he did. machines. In the first one. Oh, yeah. interesting. And in the yeah. yeah, in the first one, they just kind of made him into pot smoking Michelangelo. You yeah, know? Yes. <laughs> like, yes. mellow, Mikey. sarcastic, but yes. not as hyperactive as Mikey. Mellow, is. Mikey. Well, I I think that's that true. that's that I think is probably one of the challenges with a movie like this is. You know, as a film director, you're always supposed to ask yourself, okay, what do these characters do in each scene? And I think with a cast like that where you've, okay, you've got anthropomorphic turtles. What are they all doing in these scenes? They all have the different personalities, but what are they actually doing? And some of them, some of the scenes are just like, what the hell? Like, I think there's a scene 
where Donatello is like, well, he does machines, so he's going to help with fixing the car with Casey Jones. Right. Because yeah. he's smart. He does right. machines. I'd like to backtrack a little bit, not to... About the, the uh, April, April O'Neil sex? <laughs> but I'd like to go back. Uh, so April It's on the cutting room floor, by. Lane. Ah, <laughs> uh, you guys are wrong. Um, no, no, I'd like to just go back real quick to Judith Hogue, actually, who plays April in this movie. Yeah. Um, John and I got to meet her at Steel City Con because she had a table there and she was so nice. I just we have to talk about that just really quick because she was really kind. Uh, I thought it was really cool that she was there. It was one of the kind of characters I think that, you know, you you have to come to peace with being so famous for one character in a mm-hmm. way. I mean, she's done other work and she's been great in other stuff. And I think she wanted mm-hmm. to like put it to bed, but she like eventually she just kind of came to terms with being April. Like, you know, oh, that's that weird movie I did with the puppets. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'm going to just, you know, bury that in my past. And now I think she's come to terms with, no, I'm April O'Neil. Yeah, I, you know? I think that when you do a movie like that, you don't realize how iconic it could be. Yeah. And you I think it's easy to dismiss in that sense. But also, I don't think anyone realized how powerful pop culture was going to be to our generation and how we would keep it alive and I mean, we're a great example of that. We're talking about this 30 years later. And I think that that disconnect possibly could have started that decision making process for her where she says, OK, I'm not uh, this isn't who my what my career is. This isn't who I am. And I mean, she's done other stuff. I've seen her do guest spots on SVU. Uh, she she had Nashville. a yes, I was going to say she had a nice long turn on Nashville. She was great in Nashville, I thought. But she's done other stuff. But I mean, she's she's April at the end of the day, I think. And I think that she's finally come to terms with that but I, I wanted to just say in person she was so kind and she gave us a lot of her time which you don't always see at those right. kind of situations well it was tough for her too because she also had some problems with the production um you know she kind of doesn't mention those anymore but like it was part of why they didn't ask her to return for the second one. Oh, oh really no. um, what happened yeah, she were had, they nice to her I i'm think gonna be mad she had some issues with the the final edit like she's like this is in the movie that we were shooting and you know, it's like it was a lot darker, I think, than she thought it was going to be in the final edit. Like, oh, wow. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you don't see because you're mm-hmm. not on set that day. That's like true. when Shredder's first introduced and <laughs> like so yeah. overly sinister. She's like, what, what the fucking movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, too, I mean, when you have an expectation of making a film for kids and when you see that final edit and it's not what you were expecting. I mean, I could see that being a, a big shock, you know? Yeah. But, you know, we all love this, and everybody from our generation loves it. You know who didn't love this movie? Critics. Oh, I, oh, I yeah. can only imagine. Yeah, but I, I wonder, though, one thing. I, I feel like this is your rule, John. It's always yeah. the Yoda rule. Okay. So if Yoda hadn't worked in Empire, the whole movie would have fucking fallen apart, right? Yeah. So if these suits hadn't worked, the movie wouldn't have worked. I think the suits work oh. in, in this one. No, in this one, yes. In, and, and if yeah. they hadn't, they wouldn't have. And we'll get to that in a second, but... Owen Lieberman, who I knew for a lot of years for writing for Entertainment Weekly, gave this movie an F. An F. Finding wow. that none of the four turtles or Splinter had any personality. I, that I that's, think that's that is so bullshit. False. Patently yeah. bullshit. But if you but felt that a young audience might enjoy the film, noting that the reviewer might have gone for it too, had I been raised on Nintendo games and the robotic animation that passes for oh, entertainment. Oh, we're so on snobby. Listen to how snobby he is. Oh well, how fine for him. Yeah. You know, I wonder if it's in one of those issues that Entertainment Weekly does sometimes. They'll do an issue of We Got It Wrong, where they've given a real shitty review to either a movie that's been beloved by audiences or has done very well. Well, well hold on. I got Brian's best friend, Roger Ebert. Oh, of course. <laughs> Burning <laughs> in hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that the film is nowhere near as bad as it might have been and probably is the best Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie it supplies, in other words, more or less the t- what the Turtles fans will expect. Oh, come huh. on. I mean, I- I'm being honest with you. The movie, li- let's, let's just take a spe- step back. Okay, let's take a step back. I feel I feel like that's going to be hard for us because we but, are Turtles but, lovers. Well, we're well, right. But let's let's say I am I am John Q. Public. I, you know, time traveled here. Time, tra- time traveled to 1990. Okay. And I don't know what the hell Turtles are. But let's just take a step back here. When you're trying to explain this movie, it sounds ridiculous, okay? Oh, yeah. So if it sounds ridiculous, don't try to hold it up 
to the standard of high class cinema. It's never going to get there. It's not there ever. Okay. There's there's only so many Star Wars. There's only so many Batmans, and I'm I'm pretty sure they trashed Batman back in the day too. I think they had issues with some of the the elements of Batman. So there's no winning with someone like Roger Ebert, uh, Burning in Hell, and and you know uh, Gene Siskel. There's no there's no winning with them. Um, you know, it's a movie about anthropomorphic turtles fighting ninjas in New York City. That's it. Yeah, I, well, and the thing is, that's I think, it. <laughs> like, <laughs> part of the problem that they had that we didn't have at all was probably all the marketing that went into the cartoon show. The cartoon show was there to sell toys. It yes. was all, it was a thirty minute commercial. All of our cartoons were there to sell the, toys. You know, as little kids, we loved that because yeah, more toys. You know, but the you know the older generation who were probably like, oh, this is just some selfish disgusting cash grab now to sell even more toys and mm-hmm. and maybe to some degree that's absolutely what it was but right yeah I but I, I just i have a problem with critics who try to take something that quite literally from its inception is not quote unquote high class cinema it's not the film to watch it okay yeah it's not i, I get how it does seem insane though it and if just, you don't have a foothold on that part of culture. I think that having a, a strange concept for a film might be better received today just because our generation has a greater sense of pop culture. But back in 90, I mean... I, I don't know. It was I, a different time of cinema, I, I think. G- I guess it's a matter of, like, I love the first Toxic Avenger movie, okay? Okay, have you ever seen... As you to- should. As you yes. should. Okay, you know what I'm <laughs> talking about. I love the yeah. first Toxic Avenger film. It is a ridiculous concept. I know that no <laughs> one outside of the people like myself, and I'm, I'm guessing, John, you've seen it a couple times, um, yeah. to completely get what they're trying to do in the film. It's called paring down your expectations to what the medium is, okay? If you know it's a ridiculous concept, don't judge it by Gone with the Wind standards because it's never going to be there. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, I think I think our greater understanding in this day and age that cinema can be different things and different things to different people. Yes. I, and two, I think noticing the difference between cinema and cinema. film, I think they can be different things. The term think, popcorn film exists for a yeah. reason. And I, think that, and I think that that's okay because entertainment exists in all forms. This isn't do, a deep movie. This is not a deep movie. I'm sorry. Right. It's just... It's How dare you? <laughs> you know, I think Roger Ebert, for all the wrong reasons, did hit the... the nail on the head though that this is the best turtles movie that you could possibly get yes you know um and it's it's been 30 years later and we have not gotten anything even remotely close to what we got with this movie um and which is weird because i don't think he said that in thinking or knowing there would be more oh, yeah, turtles no, movies right. you know <laughs> well, yeah, he meant it like a dick but you know, at the end of the day this this movie was created by, you know, one of either Kevin or Peter who were high on acid. Yes. And thought an idea of, of a fighting turtle would be hilarious. And he drew it. And the next morning they said, let's make fun of Daredevil with these turtles that we've created. So the thing started as an acid induced satire of comic books. And it took off into the biggest financial juggernaut in the world. And it's John, still... how come you never want to drop acid and create something with me? You never do what I but want to do. The, the crazy thing is that it is still making money. The Turtles yeah. is still making money. It never stopped. How many properties can you imagine that are quite literally still making money off of the core idea? I think maybe Power Rangers... And then any of the Marvel or DC stuff. I mean, that's that's primarily it. Hey, Duty McDooderson, My Little Pony's still making money hand right. over fist. Right, but there I was, was saying... There was quite a window there where it wasn't, though. Bro, it was, there like was a few... 98 to 2007. No, <laughs> there was a, a period of like 92 to, to 98, yeah. I think. Yeah. I'd have to look again, <laughs> but no, I mean, but but there were lulls, and I'm sure the 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 Turtles franchise as well. So right, but what Lots I'm saying is they're still making smile. money. Like the only thing I can think of is is akin to say Power Rangers, where they are continually reinventing themselves, um, That's true. either for better or worse. I mean, uh, you know, we're not going to talk about the Michael Bay Turtle films because those oh, no. are god awful abominations. Thank you. 
Um, you. you know, but uh, I I just find it amazing that the that franchise that started from an acid trip um, <laughs> turned into something that is still making money today. Well, it's funny too because um, John and I are obsessed with the toys that made us. Yes, I, I, I saw I saw that one. Our our daily. I don't know, fever dream or just our daily rabies. Like any time we would think of it, we'd be like, oh, toys that made us. And we'd just check Twitter and in, in, in a sweat. We wanted the new season to come out. We just wanted Mostly it so bad. Episode, and yeah. we, and we, and when they finally announced a date, we like, I almost, if it had been a weekday, I would have taken the day off. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, we went and we waited for it and everything. And it was such a cool episode. It, it was so touching because they had been friends. And, you know, when you get into business with a friend. Pronouns, Kyle. Uh, the, oh, I'm sorry. The Peter Laird and Kevin Eastman. The, the, cre- the creators of the yeah. of the comic, they had been friends first, and then they created this thing. And as friends who create something often become, they became not friends because of, you know, money and issues money. and whatnot. And, and at the end, they got to see each other again. I cried. I cried real tears when they, like, got back, yeah, like, back together. together. Oh, yeah. my God. It was the sweetest thing I've ever seen. It was all that, seen. all that dirty turtle money and turtle sex. And yeah. turtle <laughs> drugs. Oh, made me so effing happy for them. It was so sweet. Turtle sex. You mean tax? Yeah. Or that, they're just dropping ooze. <laughs> Ew. Why are you guys so dirty tonight? They're, they're coming out of their shell. Oh, guys, it, is, it is like. You gosh, made it like they, that. They displayed turtle chowder. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> the sequel of the jizz. <laughs> Michelangelo. Blow. Oh, God. And we went there. <laughs> guys it is it is covid season i have been inside for 24 days i'm ready to snap <laughs> all right so do we actually want to talk a little bit about the plot of this film kind of get a in, quick run through yeah. um yeah so one of the fun things to note about this movie is they did not have a whole lot of money and because nobody believed in it for a couple of reasons uh it was Superman 4 and Howard the Duck just completely bombed at the box office. Yep. And when this was in pre-production, Batman hadn't come out yet. And I think a lot of people were predicting before the trailer for Batman 89 came out, that's going to be a shit show as well. Yep. Uh, that's going to bomb. And so nobody wanted to finance this thing. So they got very little money to kind of start this thing um, going. And oh, uh, in terms of Saturday morning cartoons, the He-Man movie had come out and that was a disaster. So, okay, Which, Saturday morning cartoons and comic books, movies, yeah. pfft, no. Don't, I have yeah. a soft spot for the He-Man movie. Oh, my God, we have to do it for the show. I <laughs> love the He-Man movie. Love it. Um, but, yeah, so they, they filmed this in North Carolina. They got a bunch of tax credits to shoot it there. They had a second unit crew that came to New York to get, like, shots of the landmarks and stuff like that. Um, but, yeah, the movie opens up with a shot from Gremlins 2 that uh, they got for free of New York City. Coming in towards the Twin Towers, RIP. Um, but it was from <laughs> Gremlins 2. So you save a little bit of money by using other people's non-used footage. <laughs> uh, April introducing us to the crime wave that's sweeping the country. I still don't know what uh, Shredder's master plan was here. There really uh, just, was no master plan other than steal, to steal shit. Steal shit and yeah. practice ninja. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that was it. And, and, and like I'm honestly like, who are you? Why are you practicing ninjutsu when you're just stealing shit like that's all you're doing you're just stealing shit and reselling it or or something like do you do you really need to to know how to you know chop someone's head off with your foot you know like i think he wanted any sense he wanted to have more beta players than anyone else in the world <laughs> <I guess so. laughs> yeah. beta's the way of the future but i always thought what if he was like training these kids to like eventually turn them into like a bane type army like oh no we're all gonna care for me you know, I don't know. Um, yes, but, you know, the fire rises. <laughs> but after April gives one of her extremely like opinion based news <laughs> reports, as she d- likes to do, and also uh, she reports to the mayor somehow that that didn't sit right with police. me. Chief oh, of mayor, chief of police. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. Yes, but, yes. Uh, Angry fat guy, chief of police man. Yeah. <laughs> you no, know, but she gets attacked, and you know, then the turtles come and save her in darkness. We get introduced to them. And Lane, as you pointed out, if these costumes don't work, this movie doesn't work. And yes. Fucking the Henson, you know, the company, they fucking nailed it. Hit yep. it out the park. Yes. They are, this is as believable as they've ever been. Because they, some for some reason, got a little bit worse for the second one. Got terrible for the third one. 
Um, I'm assuming they probably just couldn't reuse the suits. I guess. Um, I, I imagine. They were always, yeah, and then obviously we had the CGI nightmares that were the... Would they know, have the been latex? Would they have maybe degraded over time? Well, they, well they I mean... They were improperly stored, especially. I, I, I honestly just think the caliber of the mechanics just went down. I mean, honestly, I think that's mm-hmm. it. I think it takes a lot of time and energy to craft things that are going to work. And if, yeah. you know, if I'm a if I'm a movie producer and I want to, you know, protect my bottom line, I might just say, well, you know, we already got a lot of press from that first Turtles movie. So let's just cheap out on, you know, the, mm-hmm. the costume so much. I mean, don't bring the Henson company back in. Let's go get yeah. some off brand one because the second one, especially like I rewatched the second <coughs> one and I'm like, man, these are really bad. Oh, and don't yeah. forget, we wish you a turtle's Christmas. The yeah, costumes are unacceptable. Why? Why did you have to bring that one up? <laughs> because why? it's my favorite holiday tradition. Why? That that hurts so much <laughs> that you had to bring well, that fucking thing up. Try to wipe that from my memory. Uh, but well, here, I, I, if I, I have to remember it, so do you. <laughs> well, well I, here's I just, part of the reason. Oh, go ahead. Um, that they maybe did change the outfits. Now, I don't know why they couldn't have gotten them as good the second time. Is Funny. that all the mechanics that ran the head were in on their backs. And then the shell covered those. And uh, Josh Paris, who uh, played Raphael, said that it honestly sounded like a wind turbine going off in the head for all the gears going um, to run the mechanisms for the eyes and the mouth. And so not only was it hot and like there was about, you know, 50 pounds on your back. But then you also have the screeching in your ears oh. and you can't really hear for the, to do the next line. You just have to know what the lines are. So when the, the other turtle head that you can barely see is stop speaking, then it's your turn to like do your line in acting again. Uh, so I think by the second one, they were able to get all of the, the gears and stuff inside of the heads and yeah. not in the back. So I think that's why they redid the, the costumes, because it was just kind of unbearable inside the costume in the first one. Makes sense. They're just sense. not very good in the second one. Like they're they're really yeah. bad. I don't know why they all suddenly have like pimples all over them in the second one. They all have <laughs> dark spots everywhere. It's like where, they're where teenage. The, where the fuck is? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They got you, you know. There are other things that happen when you're a teenager that we don't need to see. That we don't need to see that shit. Yeah. Well, it was either pimples or turtle boners, Brian. Which one were they going to pick? That well, already was, was there boners. with yeah. April. Toners. <laughs> Toners. <laughs> Um, and I had grown as well so, in intellect and in package. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man. Why do we unleash him every week, because Brian? Why funny. do we unleash him? Because he's funny. Because we meditate. He is funny. Then we skit. <laughs> skit, skit, <laughs> my sons. But anyway, we're introduced to the turtles. We got we got Leo, who is the, the staller, you know, you're stop looking at me like that. I wish you could see me glaring at him. I just I'm looking in like the regret of an entire marriage. <laughs> That's got, every day. We got, we got the goofy party dude, Michelangelo. Got surprisingly unlike in the car- cartoon, we got kind of just wisecracking, like sardonic Donatello, and the moodiest bitch ever put in a movie, Raphael. He he is moody. He moody. really is. Everything sets him off. Like the oh, man yeah. needs some kind of medication. Like if only they had like I don't know turtle anxiety meds for him. <laughs> that might just, help. Just to even him out. There's no shame in it. Yeah. But I just remember when I was a kid when he said "damn," I was like, oh, "He said a swear." He this said so a cool. swear. I'm so awesome for watching this. I and he <laughs> and he like yells it. He yells "damn" yeah. really loud. Mm-hmm. But after yeah their their victory, you know that they they head back to the sewers to talk to. The Splinter, uh, Splinter, their their master to kind of uh, you know talk about what the fighting was like. And Splinter is run by four different people. One wow. of them that provides the voice is Elmo. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah the it's guy who is Elmo. Was he was he was he a bad guy? He's kind of like a he's. Uh, Did he turn out to be a bad guy? Like a sex pest, I think, to some degree. Sex really? Pest? Are yeah, you sure? So. Are you sure mm-hmm. about that? He was accused. I want to maybe it. we. I don't know if you can say that. Sticking a pin in that. Not sure. Not but, sure. But but wanted to call it out just in case. But somebody else was running the wires to make the head move, and then there were two people for the arms. So there was a lot that went into Splinter. Um, but of course, just to keep the movie moving, um, movie moving. 
uh, Raphael leaves, goes to a uh, goes to a movie. How many times am I going to say this word? Um, just so that he can meet Casey Jones. Casey Jones is an unhinged psychopath who just oh, hangs man. out in the <laughs> in the woods to beat Casey up kids. Casey Jones, Jones kind of scared me when I was a kid. <laughs> Casey Jones is amazing. <laughs> he is. He's literally like he's that guy. Like, um, okay, have you ever you ever seen Aqua Teen Hunger Force? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. you know the G Wiz episode where there's that one guy who's who's like he's a homeless person just say, screaming G Wiz over and over again, and he's just mumbling yeah. to himself. That's fucking Casey Jones. <laughs> <laughs> he's just some weird weird guy who's just out there be like, oh yeah. I'm, I've seen those ninjas, too, that have been stealing TVs and radios out of cars. And, yeah, I'm gonna just going to beat the shit out of them. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to wear a hockey mask and you have a, a hockey pants? stick. Yeah. And I'm going to brutally bludgeon people in Central Park. I'm just going to beat the shit out of people. Do you? How do you know? Are you a detective? No, I don't think you have the no, the brain for a detective. But, okay, Batman in I like how you pointed out the outfit as a part of the problem. That is a well, problem. It- I guess, like, if he's going to be fighting, he should be in sweatpants. But it's also, if like, the, be, the sleeveless jean jacket. If you're going to be fighting and running, <laughs> you definitely need sweatpants for freedom of movement. And that jean jacket's going to help you from being knifed. Um, well, it's extra if, protection but, for your okay, core. Okay, okay, okay. Here's a crazy concept. What if one of the foot members decides, hey, you know what? This ninja shit really doesn't work for me. So I'm just going to carry a fucking gun. Well, I mean, there's no article of clothing other, other than a... a bulletproof vest that's going to save you from that. Well, Casey but, doesn't like to carry a gun because he just wants to beat them yes. senselessly while they But I'm, I'm just saying, if one foot member decides I'm going to use a gun on Casey Jones, Casey Jones yeah. is dead. He's dead! Then, hey, then they wouldn't be the silent foot. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so then, you know, he calls Raphael a freak, um, which is understandable because he's a giant turtle and he assumes he's a human being that looks like that. Um, yeah, points out like I hate punkers and weird masks and you know green makeup. You know, <laughs> and like, okay, okay you know, bud. So, so Raphael <laughs> returns all all despondent and has a has his moment with with uh, Splinter where he he breaks down in tears. So we we know that basically Raphael has some issues. That it would be nice if there was like you know a sewer therapist or something, but unfortunately nothing they can do there. Um, <laughs> But uh, it leads to, eventually down the line, Raphael running into April to get his side back. Yep. And she is being followed by the foot because of her incredibly uh, biased news reporting. Uh, even though she Keep is Keep in right. mind, this yeah. was before Fox News. So <laughs> April there, was was totally this, beyond there. there was this thing called journalistic integrity. You didn't just What's go that? on the... But you didn't just go on the news at five o'clock and say, let me tell you, world, they're, the foot is coming. They're all over the place. The police isn't doing anything like you don't do that back then. Now, apparently, it's it's free. Just report the news. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that free be for nice? all now? <laughs> and somehow, for some reason, the, the chief of police is allowed to call her into his office and scream at her. That's not a thing. That's yeah, that that doesn't That's happen. It's not a thing, you know, Um and yeah, she she puts up with it, and as her, she continues this reporting, like the chief of police keeps calling the news station to like yell at her boss and be like, "Hey, I thought you shut her up." Like, what? Whoa. What kind of militaristic police force does New York have in this? Oh, very strange. I, I was going to say apparently, yeah, apparently New York has a militaristic police force, but they can't handle a bunch of ninjas stealing yeah. TVs. <laughs> but um, but obviously, so. Shredder sees this on his, like, 35 televisions. um, Because he needs those. (laughs) (laughs) Sends the foot after her, and they start beating the crap out of her. So, obviously, Raph comes in to save the day and leads her down to the sewers, which obviously causes the foot to find out where the turtles live. And then to kidnap Shredder while they're uh, out with April trying (laughs) trying to get some. (laughs) <laughs> they oh my god all night with her. i mean uh, yeah. that is exactly what they're doing <laughs> can you guys stop being yucky for five seconds it would be so great but i thought this was interesting that um Steve they literally was, make fun of raf for having a crush on april i'm sorry yeah i think he's actually turning red <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't mean that anybody did anything with anybody they're teenagers lane what do you think they're doing 
Yeah, if she was going to bang any of them, it was going to be Raph. Yeah. I mean, let's oh, yeah. be honest. Oh, you yeah. know? Although Leo is probably the sweltest, so, you know, I mean, and probably in the best shape, so that probably would have been the turtle she should have had sex with. <laughs> but, you know, Donnie would have been like, oh, man, I've got weed dick. But, anyways. <laughs> But uh, I, yeah, I thought it was super cool that the uh, or their origin story that Splinter tells to April while she's in the sewer, he, um, they shot that on eight millimeter to try to give it like kind of its own look, and that's where you see a lot of like the noise and stuff, which is I never you know, knew you, that. I really, yeah. I never knew that until now. But, but I mean, honestly, I, I think it's great. I think it works really well, especially because they they animated that they didn't. I don't. They just had their puppets, uh, you know, having the turtles like say. Mama, mama, and and all that. That that part was Pizza. great. <laughs> Pizza. One of them Spock. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so they you know, they they obviously take April back, which allows like very very structured, you know, typical three act structure thing, which then allows you know the foot to come and they kidnap uh, Splinter. And this is very upsetting, I think, for for a child, a children's movie that like Splinter just kind of hangs there. They torture the him. Yeah, yeah, he's being tortured. It's upsetting. Well, when, like, Shredder comes and just punches him in the face, and then <laughs> it's just like, where are they? And, like, he uh-huh. won't speak. And he's like, hang there until you die. Yeah, no. I, I think, like, you, <laughs> I think as a yeah. child, you don't process that threat fully. No, At least no, you I don't. Didn't. Yeah, they're I not didn't. giving him water or food. Um, but this also leads to a scene where they had to re-edit, because um, uh, Tatsu is kind of ashamed of what's happening, and he can tell that Shredder... You know, and Tatsu's his like, le- his Bob, his goon. It's his, his main Bob. Goon. <laughs> yeah, um, Bob from Batman eighty nine. Uh, yeah, it's his main like crony, and he's so upset that he sh- he showed weakness in front of Shredder, and the Shredder's mad at him. He goes and starts beating up one of the teenage Foot Clan members, and in the original movie, the guy checks his like throat and he goes, "He's dead," because Tatsu beat him to death. What? And wow. if you watch the, the a lot of countries, a lot of European countries, that's still how it is. But they went back. Uh, I think probably like a lot of the producers were in the screening rooms and said, "We we can't do this. We can't. We got to keep a PG rating. No, oh, yeah, got to get the kid. Got to keep kids." And so if you hear, it's really awkwardly ADR where he goes, "He's he's gonna be okay. He's gonna be okay." You can just yeah hear wow. it like so they they saved him in the American cut because they thought they were gonna lose the audience on that so well, yeah. he probably would have my god yeah. so a lot of a lot of darkness <laughs> floating around in this well listen movie. we'd yeah. already been traumatized by the never-ending story in the yeah. 80s <laughs> there's oh, there there no way that they could have taken any more away from us okay yeah. but um you know uh the uh foot eventually comes to april's place to to, to get rid of the turtles because danny uh the son of April's boss. That little shit. The little shit, yeah. <laughs> little, Otherwise, little shit. They never would have been found. Yeah, thanks a lot, you little turd. Little bastard. Um, I reached out to the actor who played him, and he um, he doesn't do interviews. So I thought was very interesting. He got back to me, and it's just like, hey, thanks, I appreciate you reaching out, but I just, I don't do interviews with anybody about... Oh, yeah, fair enough. Right. As is his right. So I was like, okay, cool. As is his right. Um, but, uh, yeah, and Casey Jones, of course, who's just continuing to be a drifter, just sees like <laughs> Raphael on the roof, um, you know, very very sneaky ninja stuff there, Raph. Uh, <laughs> which leads to a fight where a bunch of uh, men beat Raphael nearly to death. This is yep. a children's, good time. <laughs> children's film, a real feel good film. Yeah. Which leads to one of the movie's big fight scenes, which causes April's place to burn down, and then we get the the lull, the second act of all of them on the farm, where we get all of our character development. I never. I'll be honest with you. I never liked that farm section. It's it's that end of the second act, right? Where like you know you have to have everybody's kind of like come full circle in their characters and and get to know them. Yeah, yeah. Get ready for the big blah blah blah. Well, the thing I didn't like was the forced like uh, moonlighting thing between I hated that and Casey. Like what they just hate each other just so they can like learn the value of each other later and then make smoochies. Plus, like, I yeah. mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, why didn't she end up with Raphael? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> because that's also yucky, guys. Well, oh, 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 yeah. And, uh, you know, April ending up with someone who's potentially 
a uh, you know emotional and possibly physically abuser, that's not any better. Yeah. Oh. I mean, it would have been cool if she was alone, but that's always my preference in movies. Yes. I know. Oh, April, I'm so glad you're in love with me. By the way, can I crash on your couch for a week or six months? <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You you mean I have to use plates and not just tin foil to eat my food in? <laughs> <laughs> I eat off the floor. Off the wait, floor. wait. Tin no. foil can't go in the microwave since when? <laughs> since when is that? That's bizarro. You mean I can't? <laughs> you mean I can't bring my trash can into the? Into the living room and light a fire. I was trying to, try to keep you warm, you know? <laughs> Where, where's my piss corner? I have a toilet. <laughs> what? What are the Queen of England? So fancy. <laughs> oh, uh, you have an unsightly bathtub ring. <laughs> Anybody that knows all the lines of turtles will appreciate that. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah eventually, uh, this, the, somehow Leonardo uh, goes uses the power of meditation to transcend time and place. And connect uh-huh. psychically with Splinter. I know. Okay. <laughs> it is. Listen, it is. You either buy it or you don't, guys. I'm sorry <laughs> to tell you. It's a, it's psychic AOL instant messenger. Okay. That's <laughs> literally what it was. I want that. <laughs> Which causes all the turtles to go by a campfire. And then Splinter literally appears in flames. Yeah. And like <laughs> talks to all of them while they're like in deep meditation. He's like, I have always loved you, my sons. Except Mikey. He's kind of <laughs> or, or or Splinter quite literally saying, I wait a minute, I'm you 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 summoned me over fire? Don't you know I feel pain? Still? <laughs> wow. Ow, it burns. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. And roll credits. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but you know, um this uh this is also where we get the the end arc of, you know, with Raphael where Leo basically said, we don't need you. Right before he got beaten nearly to death, he comes back too. They have a, you know, a good reuniting thing. And Raphael kind of like learns to like calm his shit down a little bit. Just a little. Yeah, He does. Uh, Michelangelo doesn't really speak on the farm because he was one of those guys that didn't want to imagine a world without Splinter. When he did, it kind of shut him down, you know, but he eventually like when they come back, like regains his composure a little bit. So, you know, a lot of the turtles go through their different journeys. Uh, they return to New York and, you know, we have quite the battle in Sue. As oh man. Cause Danny escapes from the sewer, which Casey Jones sees little bastard. Yeah. And <laughs> follows him there. And, um, and of course, like little conveniences, like movie conveniences, like shredder finds Danny and was like, you know, where have you been? And reaches into his pocket and pulls out a drawing that April did. April's apparently a great artist. Uh, and he's like, mm-hmm. hey, the turtles are back. Like, because I found this drawing on him. Because I reached into this underage boy's pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> um, which, you know, th- there's the convenience to push the the final battle. And this time around, the turtles beat the li- utter living piss out of these teenage bandits. Oh, yeah. Uh, which leads to the big fight on the roof, which... It's, it's just so weird that this movie, this is the first time the main villain and the heroes meet, and it's the end of the movie. It, it is really weird because, like, you know, every movie that I can think of where you do have the main hero and the main villain meet, it's always a, a climactic point, but there's enough left over to kind of enrich that dynamic so that you get a really yeah. fulfilling ending. Like, I immediately think of, you know, uh, I mean, you get Belloc and Indiana in, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark, or even even Indiana and uh, Molaram in Temple of Doom. Those are those are classic villain meetups, you know, and then there's a payoff towards the end. This quite literally is just like, hey, I've heard about you the entire movie. Let's fight. I'm Shredder, by yeah. the way. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Oh, yeah. I By the way, I, I killed your master's... Uh, family you know yeah (laughs) i did that i did that as a human i I, as which which that kind of that part is kind of hard to watch like rewinding a little bit back in the movie you know splinter tells you know danny and stuff um and april you know different stories about how he was a a pet rat who matt who mastered of master roshi his yeah and mimicking his movements from my cage and it's just this, this but rat just ninja kicking and sh- it makes me so happy it's it's like stop motion i think and it's but just the best ever. here's the thing i have 
here's the problem I have. Okay, he he was mimicking movements of someone doing ninjutsu before he was exposed to ooze. What fucking yeah. rat does that? He he's he's beyond other rats. Brian, oh, yeah. if that's your problem with this movie, I cannot help you. Everything I'm just like, saying. He attacks a Matayoshi, who <laughs> ends up being Shredder. Which at the end of the movie they treat that like it's a big reveal. No, no, like, um, Amata Yoshi. Amata Yoshi is the master. Oroku oh, Saki. Oroku Saki. Oroku Saki is Shredder. <laughs> yeah, Oroku Saki. Yeah, which they reveal at the end, and it was like, yeah, you guys yeah. have basically been telling us that the entire movie. But, um, but yeah, the rat attacks him and he cuts his ear and then leaves. Like, what a vindictive little bitch! Like, either kill the the mouse or just leave it's a rat john <laughs> how dare you are they different are mice and rat different yes yes, yes okay. they are uh, all right and then i don't know how he got to the united states I guess well we no they the they, they immigrated they immigrated his master and his wife immigrated and then oh, so they tracked him down and okay. killed him yeah oh my god you guys are such <laughs> nerds um but, yeah what's your point <clears throat> nothing no point but after Casey Jones, like, free Splinter so that he can join the end battle, uh, um, you know, one of the uh, Foot Clan members, which I think is a really nice touch, is like, you know, oh, we're a family down here, you know, and he, and he chastises him by, like, looking around and saying, you call this a family, where it's like, oh, Casey Jones, like, wanted to be solo and do it all on his own, but he's learned the value of family. Boy, That's because he got a piece of April. <laughs> yeah. That's because he got a piece of April. Yeah. <laughs> listen, listen I, by the end of the time the turtles were done with him, Casey was finally housebroken. He learned to sleep in his crate, okay? <laughs> he could eat out of plates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was his development. No, quit eating the paper plate. That's not food, too. I got food on it. <laughs> uh, but I'm eating pizza, and the grease is getting into the paper plate. I don't want to waste anything. <laughs> but, yeah, meanwhile, uh, Shredder is just beating the out of the turtles oh man because and there i gotta say the one criticism i have about this movie is shredder's fucking outfit (laughs) what his purple pajamas he's wearing glittery purple pajamas (laughs) purple's my favorite color i see no problems here (laughs) yeah but like he's fucking shredder and he's i guess he's a lot of freedom of movement (laughs) <laughs> did, no, but did no one just think, hey, maybe we should put some, like, armor on him or, I don't know, something? Like, maybe, like, some sort of vest? No, he's wearing, literally, he's got, like, his shoulder blade thing, which, you know, in the 80s, that was the thing. Everyone wore fucking shoulder blades. But, like, he's quite literally... Shoulder pads. Shoulder, shoulder pads, pads, excuse me. Shoulder pads. You know, and that's that's classic Shredder. Um, you know, the helmet's great and the mask is great, but why is he fucking wearing... Glittery, glittery PJs. Glittery PJs. <laughs> hey, don't judge a man by his pajamas. He he might just end up whooping your ass. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I guess. But, you know, the turtles use the brilliant strategy of attacking one at a time. Instead yes. of just four of them fighting him. <laughs> um, but Leo almost gets the best of him. He gets knocked down. And then Shredder makes him throw their weapons away. Which Why would decides- you do that? I guess to save his life, uh, you know, like, <laughs> he dies. Huh? Weapons? No. Uh, <coughs> why would you take him at his word, though? Like, I quite literally be yeah. like, "You're gonna fucking kill him anyway." Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I get, and then yeah, he wants to impale him. I'm assuming in the throat. You know, something hor- like horribly violent. Um, which then Splinter shows back up. So I don't really know how he climbed up all those, you know, stairs and stuff. Like, because he's magic. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, he has learned, you know, the value of Splinter has of, of patience and, uh, and timing where, you know, Shredder patience is all and anger and, <laughs> and, you know, jealousy and rage, which is what his uh, undoing is because, you know, uh, Splinter uses his momentum against him. And here's the thing. Splinter doesn't kill him. Shredder technically almost kills himself by causing uh, Splinter to lose hold of him. Then Casey Jones comes by and says, you know what? Let's just make sure this person does die a miserable, painful death. 
Listen, I said he was housebroken, okay? He's not perfect. Uh, I mean... In front of police and authorities and media, he just crushes them in a garbage compact. It's, I mean, it's fine, okay? Well, 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 well. What you're <laughs> forgetting, John, <laughs> is that apparently Casey Jones is not very good at killing people because in a year later, Shredder's going to wake back up perfectly fine in purple pajamas. In the um, dump. Yeah. <laughs> spoiler alert, rude. <laughs> and with, like, more spikes on his clothes yes. somehow. Yeah. And apparently yeah. something happened to his face. We don't know. We just know his face <laughs> is more fucked up rude. than it was before. Yeah. Rude. And he, he almost looks like a new actor. It's so, yes. odd. so odd. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Uh, kind of weird how that happens. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the Turtles are reunited with their... With their uh, Master. Master and April and Casey start having sex in the street. And she gets, not. Uh, what basically. is wrong with you? No, they, they they start making smoochies, and she gets a big promotion where she can go off on these rants. Uh, and then she gets hired by freak. Fox News years later. Yeah, and yeah exactly. <laughs> it's Gretchen Welcome Carlson. The okay, that's who it was. <laughs> April would never. <laughs> Maybe she'd be on MSNBC, you know, so she'd be like the liberal Fox News, you know what I mean? Like, with all of her. She'd be like Rachel Maddow. Yes. Okay, yeah. fine. That's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I think that, as we said at the top of this episode, this is as good as a Turtles movie can be. Yeah. Uh, Damn and they, right. Yeah. And I I don't think they were thinking about a sequel because they followed, I think, like basically the first six comic books in the in uh, in the chrono- chronology. Chronology. Um, yeah, they took, obviously, a few things <laughs> for themselves. But, you know, in the... Or very early on in the Turtles lore of the comics, they uh, kill off Shredder. And so they just kind of follow that with this movie. I don't think they thought, that, oh, we'll bring him back in the next one. Um, if they had, they wouldn't have tr- crushed him in a <laughs> trash compactor. That feels like a movie uh, decision anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, they killed him off like they did, did in the comics. So, yeah, this, you know, movie very much does follow the comic books. I, I think, to its benefit, you know, I, I remember as kids, we were all like, when are we going to get Krang and... And Bebop and Rocksteady and Dimension yep. X, like those, that would have been fucking awful. I mean, I probably would have loved it at six. I would but, like they would have been <laughs> terrible goddamn movies. Yeah, but the the technology just wasn't there to do it. And I mean, you know, plus also what happened, you know, a couple of years ago when they did do that with the sequel to the Michael Bay movie. You know, they yeah. they did do Krang and and Bebop and Rocksteady and Dimension X, and it was terrible. So yeah. even even with you know the technology it it just it doesn't work it doesn't work some things just don't work um so what are, just kind of over, looking over all the the aspects of the film what uh what do you guys make of i think what is the mo- the best thing in this movie is the what's always overlooked is the set design costume design art direction production design um and you know uh, steve uh, baron comes from the uh, world of music videos where everything is told visually um, and I think that this movie knocks it out of the park, you know, even just simple scenes, like when the pizza is being delivered, you know, you, you get a sense of New York in the shot, you get like garbage bags piled up, you know, you, even the stuff on the farm is shot beautifully, the sewer, like all the production design in the sewer, like in their lair, like, uh, it's just, I think it's really beautifully shot. And I think that is probably one of its biggest successes. What, what do you what do you make of that? I think they do a great job with setting, too. I think that they do a great job of making it feel like New York, even though they shot very little of the production there. I think right. that's a really big win for their process and for them making a lot of film with very little money. For, for me, I, I, I absolutely love the set design. The other thing that I really appreciate with this movie that I think is hard to do now is go with a mature tone. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, it's, I don't see any, I mean, outside of maybe a few movies that have to go R rated, uh, you know, you very rarely see superhero films. And I guess this can kind of constitute as a superhero film. Um, go with a more mature storytelling. Like, there are elements in this movie that are very much above the heads of children, you know, and clearly mm. they're of the mind of, you know, you're dealing with you know, family issues. And that family seems to be a big element in this particular 
movie is the families that that are are working that are that are dynamically functional but maybe on the surface don't look like the traditional family the turtles you know in splinter are a traditional family unit that doesn't have the the outer vestiges vestiges of a traditional family unit and then you have the danny character the little shit character um (laughs) he has a kind of a broken home situation with his father you've got also kind of the anti-family with the foot you know, there's there's a lot of those sorts of very serious uh, plot points that I don't think superhero films really try to address, um, and that's a refreshing thing. That tone being more mature uh, in in a quote unquote children's film is something you don't see, and it's nice to see that. What did you guys make of the uh, the acting in this film? Uh. <laughs> I it mean, it's easy a, for anybody. Uh, yeah, I mean, what? Do, it, what are you gonna do? You know, you, you're literally. It's it's you know. Oh well, what do you do? I'm going to work today. What are you doing? Oh, I'm working on the turtles film. Oh, what's your scene? Oh well, I got to talk to you know so and so. He's in a green suit. He can't hear any of my lines because there's a <laughs> fucking wind wind noise going through his head. You know what? What are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to have acting for that? You know. So I think the fact that they did anything. And it's competent, good for them. You know, I, I like that's kind of where I'm at on it. I agree. I think, too, there was no precedent for this at the yeah. time either. You know, because obviously now there's a challenge where you're obviously working with CGI characters. You're acting in environments that are all green screen. Um, in this case, you're working with giant puppets of turtles yep. and working with elements that are only going to come together in post. But... I'm sure they have acting coaches to help you with that sort of thing now. That wouldn't have been the case in 1989 when they were shooting this, most likely. Yeah, And it's interesting that there's no... Now, I don't think they could have afforded anybody, but there's no big name in this thing. Like, Mm -hmm. Judith Hogue is probably the biggest name in in the biggest movie she had done before this was Cadillac Man, and that was right before this. Interesting little trivia fact. Robin Williams was a huge fan of the Turtles comic book and helped her learn... Like how to become April O'Neil? Wow! No way! I yeah. didn't know that. He like gave her a bunch of his comics so that she could read it, you know. And uh, but yeah, there's no big star in this movie. Oddly, the biggest star is probably Corey Feldman. I was gonna just, say. I was gonna he's say. Just the voice of Donatello, but they and they actually screwed him on the paycheck because they told they gave him paid him fifteen hundred bucks and they said like, look, you only be here for a little bit, and this movie's not gonna bomb anyway. So you know. Don't worry about it. You know, it's not like we're going to make any money off of it on our end either. And then it becomes the highest grossing independent film of all time. Until the Blair Witch Project. I was going to say $202 million later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The highest grossing independent film of all time. I can't believe people didn't believe in, you know, this with how popular the Saturday morning cartoon shows. When there's a serial, you know that like, oh, yeah, yeah make the movies, make the movies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Serials where you draw that line, John. Yeah. But guys, um, yes, yes, I do. Okay. Uh, you know who? You know who edited this, right? Sally Menke. Uh, no uh, way, Quentin Sally. Quentin Tarantino fame. Yeah. Aww. Wow. Uh, Rest, in, Rest peace, in peace, Sally. Yeah. She was, and the thing is, that I think they also took the editing away from her because they're like, you don't know what you're doing. She's an Oscar winner now for editing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but this is one of her her first films. Um, yeah, also it, important to yeah. note: first films here. Uh, yeah. Sam Rockwell. Is the head yes. thug? Oh yeah, he's yeah. in that. Another yep. Oscar winner. Yeah, uh, Skeet Ulrich and Scott oh, Wolf. Yep, are Foot Clan members. Yep, yes. crazy. Yep. Yeah, crazy. Skeet Ulrich. Um, he's on Riverdale now, which is so upsetting to me since he was the boyfriend in Scream, and now he's a dad on Riverdale. Like, <laughs> hey, it makes me feel very old. Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously this movie was a huge success. So I think about 14 months later, the second one came out. I loved it, the second one when I was a kid, but I was also six. Um, yep. I, I can't even watch the second one now unless it's purely, if it's on cable and I just want a nostalgia kick, I'll put it on. I can watch, I watch probably the first one at least once a year. The second one, I just, uh, it's just so cringeworthy to me that I can't believe six-year-old John loved this movie. But because they take a completely tonal sh- like shift that, the, you know, the parent council flipped out so they couldn't use their weapons. They couldn't, you know, no more swearing, no more dark alleys, no more <laughs> violence. You know, it's just 
yeah, people are hitting people with coal cuts and shit like that. Whoa. You know? yeah. Um, yeah, the second one is just, you know, it's really just kind of unwatchable. It, especially it's, when we get to Vanilla I, Ice. Yeah, that that part really... Yeah. I mean, as, as I said, kind of what you were saying, John, as, as a six-year-old, you're like, this is the greatest thing that's ever existed. This is better than the first one. And then... As like a thirty-four-year-old, you watch this and you're just like, "Man, man, oh man, what the hell were they thinking?" <laughs> you know? Yeah, cold cut combo. That right there, that defies the entire movie. Cold cut combo. And of all the weapons, why did the parents go after the nunchucks? Not like the swords or size, like of. I don't know. They're all violent bludgeoning or stabby weapons. Here's my but. guess regarding that. My guess is that majority of the kids who were acting out the turtles were acting as Michelangelo because that's the fun one. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the most relatable to children. And whatever the most relatable to children character is doing, that's the one they're going to go after. So, yeah, he's got nunchucks as weapons. Now, every kid is ta- tying, like, you know, their socks together and turning them into nunchucks. You know, so so that's what they're doing. But whatever, <laughs> with batteries in the end. Of them, that's like, right. Bashing each that's other. That's right. Man. Brian, who was your favorite turtle growing up? Oh, I was Michelangelo. Yeah, I was a Raphael <laughs> man. Yeah. Ooh, I like Donnie. Yeah. <laughs> no, Leo. No, no one likes Leo. No, he's the Cyclops likes Leo. of this crew, isn't he? <laughs> Maybe he is. He, he is the Cyclops of the crew. Nobody, nobody likes him. He he's the guy you want in battle, but you're not going to cheer for him. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Oh, but, um, man. I feel like we kind of, uh, let's get to our wrap up here. I feel like sure. I'm exhausted, but it's just something that I just, just popped in my head and it's a little late for it, but I just want to talk to you guys about it and see what you thought. What, did you guys find it very odd that the promotional campaign went to Pizza Hut, but in the movie itself, it's Domino's? Yes. How do they have two different pizza companies? No, I was a fucking kid and I didn't notice. And as an adult, I still didn't notice. Yeah. Sorry, John. But like, yeah. I got uh, it. I did yeah, not understand. I didn't understand it because, like, here's the thing, and you were probably the same way. As a kid, you're trying to mimic the movies you're watching. So, like, I'm watching Turtles, and I'm like, okay, well, the beginning of it's Pizza Hut, so I should go order Pizza Hut, right? Like, like I should get that because the Turtles are eating that. And then you watch a movie, you're like, what the fuck? They're eating Domino's? Yeah. <laughs> how does that work? I, yeah, I don't know how, like, both these companies weren't like, look, if you're working with Domino's, you can't work with us and vice versa. Like, but... Um, cause you just do not see that now where it's like, oh, we had Burger King and McDonald's in the movie. Like what? No, you can't do that. Then, I mean, um, you know, the closest thing I can think of is Demolition Man in the franchise wars with Taco Bell. Uh, Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> it won the franchise wars. Um, yeah, just, so just kind of like on last thoughts on this, I find it very hard to, properly put into an intellectual context of this film because I think I am so blinded by nostalgia. I look at a movie like Hook and I'll always like Hook to some degree because I loved it as a kid, but I can tell you that Hook is pretty much crap. Yeah. You know, it's it's very forgettable B minus kind of movie, but I'll always love it to some degree because I grew up with it. This one I'm completely blinded by how much I love this film as a kid. So I don't even know if I can properly say, do I really think this movie is great as a film past like my childhood? Or can I not look past that and, and look at it, uh, you know, on a more of a cerebral level. So I find it very hard to say, is this movie really great? Or is it just John's childhood? Great. I I do think that when love comes into effect for some of these movies, I think that we have a hard time distancing ourselves and maybe that's this movie for you, but that's okay. That's okay. Sometimes it's nice to love something that much. Let's be honest. Yeah. I, I know for me, I will say that over the years, um, this movie, despite the fact that I loved it as a kid, it has not been one of those movies that I'm like, Oh my God, this is the greatest movie of all fucking time. It's not. Um, yeah. I'd say like that type of love that you're talking about, John is more reserved for, say, the 89 Batman, where it is very, very, very hard for me to look at that film objectively and break it down. It's one of those movies where it's like, you know, five-year-old Brian got his love of of film from watching that movie. So it's hard for me to take a step back and be like, all right, what are some of the things that just don't make any fucking sense? That said... 
after rewatching Turtles again with my, you know, nearly two year old daughter, um, this movie definitely does hold up, in my opinion. It, it really is a it, it's it's a great movie, as I said, about family, um, which superhero films typically don't go that deep. Like they just, they just don't. They don't go dark. Uh, and and it's it is absolutely what I'll give credit to Robert Roger Ebert. It's the best Turtles movie you could possibly make. That's it. And I think. I think everybody involved just took it so damn seriously. And that's great. You know, like, yeah, and I think that, that it shows, and that's what helps it maintain itself. Where the second one was like, oh, we're just making a goofy kids movie, right? And then yeah. it's un- unwatchable as time goes on. Yeah, no, but this yeah. is definitely watchable, and I'd say it's 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 good. Yeah, you know, it, and it, again, you have to take a step back and say, this is a movie about anthropomorphic turtles. Don't expect... <laughs> Gone with the fucking wind. Nick, that's it. If you know what you're getting into, then you're fine. <laughs> Temper yeah. your expectations, you know? I, I would be fascinated to watch this with somebody who never saw it as a kid, like didn't grow up with turtles, like, but is roughly our age and just see what they think of it, you know? Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know anybody like that because most people no, I neither know do I. saw turtles to some degree or another. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that would be interesting. But yeah, I um, I still love this movie, and I will be watching it for another thirty years. <laughs> awesome, <laughs> awesome, uh, awesome. Well, Lane, what are your final comment comments on that? Because I don't think you did. You shared with us. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's uh, definitely a, 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 I feel like a series of good luck, good fortune, and some good decisions that were made on the part of the filmmakers. I think that something that was done in the nineties is that children's programming was created with adults in mind. And I think that's given it a better longevity. Yes. And then a lot of entertainment we see now. And I think that that's been helpful. And I think that's the case for this movie. Um, I also love the turtles and I think I can safely say though, that this movie is still a good movie. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not blinded by love, you know, in that sense. I mean, there's, there's we, we would be talking about different movies if we were talking about being utterly blinded by love. Right. But I think that we can say that this movie does still hold up. And I think it's very cool that we're talking about it 30 years later, even though that makes me feel ancient. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, I think we've we've uh, turtled out of our shell <laughs> <laughs> uh, for this episode. Uh, John, where can they find you at on the Twitter machine? At the Unreal J Wolves. Lane? LA underscore Croft. You can find me at, at Brian Connington. I'm also on the Psycho Show page. Be sure to like us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at Psycho Show. You can also find us on the Epicast Network at epicastnetwork.com. If you have a favorite movie or question you want to throw away, you want to talk to us about your fond memories of eating pizza while watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, contact us at cinemapsychoshow.com. And make sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and iTunes. And we will see you next time. April, the mutant shit made me rock hard. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome.